Hello, everybody. Welcome to the program uh, today entitled Below the Knee Implants and Dissection Repair, a Review of Current Applications and New Data. My name is Dr. John Rundeback, and I'll be the moderator for today's program. I'm really thrilled to have uh, with me uh, today uh, Dr. Aaron Armstrong, Dr. George Adams, and Dr. Michael Lichtenberg. I'm the medical director of the Interventional Institute of Holy Name Medical Center and managing partner of New Jersey Endovascular and Amputation Prevention. Dr. Adams is the Interventional Cardiology Director in, of the Cardiovascular and Peripheral Vascular Research uh, uh, at uh, UNC Rex Healthcare, Associate Professor of Medicine at UNC School of Medicine in Chapel Hill, New, uh, uh, North Carolina. Dr. Aaron Armstrong is a Professor of Medicine and Cardiology at University of Colorado in Aurora, Col uh, Colorado. And Dr. Michael Lichtenberg is Director of the Arnsberg Vascular Clinic, Arnsberg Vascular Center in Arnsberg, Germany. So thank you all for participating today. It's a great honor and privilege to have you on tonight's program. This program is approved for one CME, CNE, AAPA, CART uh, credit. That's provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, which is an HMP company. And this uh, program is supported by an educational grant from Intact Vascular. The learning objectives of this program are to identify and properly grade dissections and arteries below the knee, which can be quite challenging to understand the data surrounding new BTK implant technology and be able to apply this to clinical practice and to determine the optimal course of treatment for advanced CLI patients. I will now turn the program over to Dr. Armstrong, who will be discussing general information about dissections uh, and their relevance within clinical practice, which is the main focus of today's talk. Okay, well, I think we've got a really exciting program uh, for you with regards to dissections and their clinical re relevance. Over the course of the next few minutes, I'm going to be discuss discussing dissections and the evidence for post balloon angioplasty dissection and their impact on clinical outcomes. So when we look at lower extremity balloon angioplasty in general, with regards to femoral popliteal lesions, the TAS-2 guidelines recommend that balloon angioplasty be a primary endovascular treatment for symptomatic TAS A and B femoral popliteal lesions. With regards to infrapopliteal lesions, there are no specific TAS-2 recommendations, but the reality is that balloon angioplasty remains the most common method of endovascular therapy for the below-the-knee arteries. And in real-world practice, we're often faced with situations where we're treating complex femoropopliteal and infrapopliteal lesions that may not otherwise be reflected in the guidelines. And so in order to maximize the overall patency and long-term durability of these interventions, we need to perform the best possible balloon angioplasty and also understand the factors that may affect uh, long-term outcomes in these vessel segments. And the reality is that durability of interventions is limited in both of these lesion segments by recoil, remodeling, and dissection. So fundamentally, the mechanism of balloon angioplasty is to create a dissection. Uh, research has shown that balloon angioplasty increases the arterial lumen. There is a trade-off between luminal gain and the development of a dissection, such that uh, in order to achieve the necessary luminal gain and subsequent flow, it may in some cases actually be more likely to cause a dissection in order to make enough cross-sectional diameter and flow in that target vessel. So another way of stating this is that dissections really are a necessary effect of all balloon angioplasty. And there are multiple predictors of dissection. As you'd expect, these include long lesion lengths, the presence of an occlusion that, you're being, that is being treated with balloon angioplasty, and also importantly, calcification. Uh, research has shown that dissections are more likely to occur at areas of uh, contrast between severe and less severe calcification due to the shear forces that occur at that uh, site. And increasingly, we have evidence that as we increase the severity of a dissection that is visualized after blue angioplasty, there is a lower likelihood of short-term vessel patency. And I'm gonna go into this in a little bit more detail. But first, let's talk about how frequently dissections happen. Above the knee, we have data that dissections are reported in between 50 to 84% of SFA and proximal popliteal angioplasties. And this is irregardless of whether we're talking about balloon angioplasty or drug-coated balloon angioplasty. Below the knee, we have less data, and this is really an emerging area that we'll discuss in more detail today. Uh, dissections have been reported in approximately a third of below knee balloon angioplasty procedures, but I believe this is also underreported due to the smaller vessel diameter, as well as the presence of overlapping bony segments that may confound the analysis of dissection in these vessel segments. 
And I would say that in most cases, we tend to rely on angiography to identify dissections. And typically we look for contrast collecting between the fractured intima and the exposed media. I'll show you examples of a few of those in a few, um, in a few slides. However, other adjunctive imaging modalities can also be helpful for visualizing and identifying dissection and their severity. This can include optical um, computed tomography uh, or intravascular ultrasound. So how do we characterize dissections? Well, currently the method of characterizing dissections in the periphery is actually based on what was originally a quaternary classification developed by the NHLBI a few decades ago. And there is actually no consensus yet on classifying peripheral arterial dissection, but the NHLBI system, because it has been around and has been established, has been used in uh, all of the studies to date that have been conducted in the periphery and they were the basis of the dissection categorization in the TOBA studies that we'll be develop, uh, discussing throughout this uh, program. So this categorization is, is graded A through F with increasing severity. A is minor radiolucent areas. B is a linear dissection. C is the presence of contrast outside of the lumen. D is a spiral dissection. E is persistent filling defects. And F is a total occlusion without a distal antebrake flow. These are some other examples of these types of dissections from an informative paper by Fujihara et al. in the Journal of Endovascular Therapy that nicely shows uh, with arrows where the dissections are and outlines the overall location of the dissection on these vessel segments, showing a few other good examples of type A and type B dissections uh, on this slide. And then subsequently on this slide showing the encroachment of the lumen in a type C dissection, the spiral action of a type D dissection, the persistent filling defects in an E dissection, and the lack of forward luminal flow in a type F dissection. So what is the actual association between dissections and their subsequent patency and need for revascularization? The sh short story is we don't have a lot of data yet in the infrapopoteal balloon uh, segments with regards to dissections and patency, but this will be an important emerging area over the course of the next few years. Within uh, the femoral popliteal segment, we do have data uh, in this paper that I mentioned by Fujihara et al. with regards to 748 de novo SFA lesions. And what they found was that dissection occurred during balloon angioplasty in 84% of these cases. And among cases where dissections occurred, stents were placed 74% of the time, and 26% were treated with balloon angioplasty alone. And the authors subsequently examined the severity of dissection and outcomes after POBA only. And what they found when they looked at dissection prevalence, I mentioned that uh, dissections occurred in uh, over 84% of cases. And uh, what they found was that the breakdown was that the less severe dissections such as type A or type B occurred 19 and 23% of the time. But the more severe dissections graded C through F occurred 42% of the time. These are also often underestimated. We have some data from the TOBA study where investigators reported dissection severity and then a core lab adjudicated the dissection severity. And you can see here that the uh, baseline dissection grade as adjudicated by the uh, people doing the intervention in the light blue was uh, more often than not less severe than what was adjudicated by a core lab. So I think a, a note of caution as well that we often tend to underestimate the severity of the dissections that occur after balloon angioplasty. And now here's the real uh, summary of the Fujihara paper that I think really provides the impetus for treating dissections. And what they found was that there was a stepwise progression between the dissection grade severity and the risk of restenosis in the SFA. You can see here when the dissections were categorized by type, as in A through F, and the hazard ratio for stenosis, you can see that there was an uptick uh, with dissections such that by the time you got to C, D, E, and F dissections, you had 10, 100, and 1,000 fold risk of restenosis. So I think it really provides the impetus for understanding how to treat these dissections uh, because uh, when this was uh, also <clears throat> dichotomized by severe or non-severe dissections, you can see that there's a very strong relationship between the severity of the dissection and subsequent patency, such that dissections of type C or above had 12 month patency that was only basically 10%. And consistent with this, there was a high rate of target lesion revascularization if a dissection was not treated. You can see here that among patients who had remaining uh, dissections after balloon angioplasty, that severe dissections were associated with TLR rates of around 80%. 
So that's one mechanism for categorizing dissections. I'll talk briefly about a second mechanism that was proposed. Uh, this classification was proposed by Kobayashi et al. And this was also a study of balloon angioplasty in the SFA that looked at 319 uh, lesions, and they were divided into three groups. The goal here was to make a more simplified categorization. They categorized things as no dissection, mild dissection with a width less than a third of the lumen, or severe dissection, meaning a width of the lumen rate greater than one third. And uh, this is just examples of uh, what these look like uh, with regards to no dissection, a dissection less than a third of the lumen, or more than a third of the lumen, as shown here in group C. And interestingly, what they found was that if a lesion was under 100 millimeters, the presence of a minimal dissection was not correlated with much difference in overall patency. But interestingly, even the less severe dissections, less than a third of the lumen diameter, having one of those was associated with a severely reduced patency uh, among lesions greater than 100 millimeters. And I think these data are important because they emphasize that there's likely a relationship not just between the severity of the dissection, but also the length of the lesion that's being treated as these two likely interact in the likelihood of developing restenosis. So all of those data were for balloon angioplasty, but what about drug-coated balloon angioplasty? Well, the, the, the same mechanistic forces occur leading to dissection with drug-coated balloons. So it's likely that the prevalence of dissections after balloon angioplasty is quite similar. The clinical tri trial data that we have for drug-coated balloon angioplasty is significantly biased by the exclusion of cases with severe dissection after initial POBA. And as a result, there were no patients with severe dissection that were included in the pivotal trials. And what we have as an unanswered question is whether dissections heal better or worse after drug-coated balloon angioplasty. And certainly, the presence of paclitaxel can help interrupt the restenosis cascade, but it may also be that paclitaxel would delay the healing from a dissection flap, flap and potentially be associated with as bad or worse outcomes uh, with a dissection due to the presence of paclitaxel. With regards to some of the data that we do have, we have some data with regards to dissections from the THUNDER trial. You can see here that in the Thunder trial, in the control group and the paclitaxel coated balloon group, you can see the rates of dissection severity. And there was a prevalence of some grade B, C, and D dissections uh, that you can see in each of those groups occurring in um, approximately 30 to 40% of cases. And interestingly, if there was a dissection uh, in the Thunder trial, there was a stepwise association between the severity of the dissection and binary restenosis. You can see that at uh, six months, the rates of binary restenosis with no dissection were 43%, 50% after an AB dissection, and 62% after a CD or E dissection. And the same was observed with six-month patency, as well as rates of target lesion revascularization. And uh, the other data that we have with regards to drug-coated balloons was from a German sub-analysis of the Lutonic study that showed that uh, there was a prevalence of some B and C dissections as well as A dissections uh, in that registry. And uh, interestingly, the dissection rate, you know, was uh, also stepwise as would be expected with longer lesions. The same was observed in the impact admiral registry with higher rates of what were investigator reported dissections with longer lesions. And consistent with that, there was also a higher rate of bailout stent use such that in long lesions greater than 150 millimeters, stents are generally used 35 to 40% of the time. And I often think of this as a proxy for having had a severe dissection, as that is often the impetus where an investigator may have decided to place a stent. And then finally, uh, I'm gonna transition over to dissections after below the knee angioplasty, which is the topic of a lot of the rest of the discussion today. As I mentioned earlier, it is more difficult to identify dissections due to smaller vessel size and overlapping bony segments in the infrapopetial vessels. I think we also, as a community, have a tendency to undersize balloon angioplasty below the knee relative to the true artery size. And I think there are a number of reasons for this, including the lack of good bailout therapies below the knee, uh, but not having as much luminal gain may also translate to fewer dissections. So I think that really there's a need out there to optimize the overall luminal gain and size balloons one-to-one -one or 1.1-to-1 1 .1 1 relative to the reference vessel. And this may result in some cases uh, in a slightly higher dissection rate, but I think ultimately uh, if we're able to treat those dissections, we'll be able to improve the patency and achieve better flow as well below the knee. 
And of course, recoil is an additional issue in below the knee angioplasty. This is also an ongoing area of investigation. And the reality is, if you look at the studies that we have below the knee, there is still a need for mechanical support. Uh, the data that we have from the Debellum and Impact Deep trials did suggest that there was a dissection rate between 15 and 30 percent, and that mechanical support is still necessary in order to treat these vessels well and maximize patency. So in summary, grade C to F dissections occur greater than 50 percent of the time after balloon angioplasty, and having a dissection is associated with decreased patency and increased TLR after POVA. Mechanical support is still needed after drug-coated balloons and certainly in real-world lesions as well. And we currently have minimal data on the prevalence of infrapopoteal dissections post-angioplasty, but I think it's clear that they will also affect patency and affect the overall wound healing of patients with infrapopoteal disease. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Armstrong. That was uh, really uh, fabulous. So let me uh, turn the uh, uh, talks now over to Dr. Adams, again from UNC Rex Healthcare, who's going to show us the current applications and new data uh, surrounding uh, the uh, use of tax uh, in treatment of dissection below the knee. Much of this was recently presented at Viva Lake Breaking uh, Clinical Trials online, uh, and uh, Dr. Adams will uh, clearly uh, add to what's been shown there. Thank you. Dr. Adams? John, I appreciate it. Um, so let's talk about chronic limb threatening ischemia. So again, it affects about two to three and a half million people in the United States. The treatment strategy, as Aaron alluded to early, er, earlier in this population, is typically balloon angioplasty, and dissections occur frequently and predicts restenosis. So let me introduce the TAC into vascular system. This is a four French system uh, that has four preloaded nitinol implants called TAGs. They're six millimeters in length, and each implant can treat a 1.5 to 4.5 millimeter reference vessel diameter vessel. It's an over-the-wire the, over the delivery system. It goes, goes over an 014 inch wire, has 150 centimeter working length, and is pretty accurate in deployment at less than or equal to one millimeter. When we look at the data to date, three trials above the knee showing great safety and efficacy, as you can see here, and then two trials below the knee. One is TOBA below the knee, which was a prospective single arm, single arm six European uh, and New Zealand sites. And as you can see, from an efficacy standpoint, there was a 93.5% 12-month Kaplan-Meier freedom from clinically driven TLR as well as an 84.5% 12-month amputation-free survival rate, as well as a 78.4 Kaplan-Meier patency rate. The six-month data has already been presented in today's uh, lesson will we'll focus on the 12-month data, but just remembering the TOBA-2 below the knee six-month data, there was a 92% six-month Kaplan-Meier freedom from clinically driven TLR, 96% six-month Kaplan-Meier amputation-free survival, and about 74% of these at six months, the wounds healed or improved. The safety was great with a 1.3% bailout stent rate and 100% dissection resolution. The study design and follow-up there, the populations were critical limb ischemic patients with angiographic evidence of dissection, and was up to the physician to decide whether this dissection needed to be repaired with a scaffold in the mid-distal popliteal, tibial, and or perineal arteries. 233 patients at 41 U.S. international sites were enrolled in the primary endpoints, safety, male plus perioperative death at 30 days, and efficacy, the freedom from major adverse limb events at six months and perioperative death at 30 days. Secondary endpoints, as you can see, were tax segment patency at six months, duplex ultrasound flow or no flow, and then target limb salvage at six months. And there were several key observational endpoints, including um, quality of life metrics, um, Rutherford uh, improvement or detriment, um, and wound status, as well as freedom from CDTLR, dissection resolution, target lesion patency, and amputation-free survival. The enrollment, again, included 233 patients. There was one month, six month, and 12 month follow-up. 
I'd like to thank the investigators for the Toba 2 below the knee uh, study, as you can see here. When we look at the demographics of the population, the, there was an older population, um, mean age was 74. They were, majority of them were male. Rutherford four and five, since most of the, or the lesions were treated below the knee. 66% of these were diabetics. 25% of these had chron uh, chronic renal insufficiency. The lesion length, well, one thing to notice first, the reference vessel diameter, there was about a millimeter difference from proximal to distal in these, uh, in these vessels, making this tag that I mentioned earlier nice but because it could treat an array of different sizes with one tag. The lesion length on average was 154 millimeters. 48% of these had a total occlusion. Um, and as you can see, the uh, vessels that were treated, the majority were tibial compared to the popliteal, which only entailed approximately 5%. So distal delivery, uh, again, with no fractures, the title of this slide, the dissections per patient were about 1.4 on average. The length was about 24 millimeters. What's interesting, if you look at the dissection grade here, remember that the physician decided whether they needed to be treated if there was a dissection. The majority of the dissections were graded as either A or B, um, and it was about 60%, whereas the rest, uh, about 40% of these were C, D, or E. The device for success was high. In fact, the dissection resolution per core lab was 100%. Um, the bailout stent rate to the tax segment was low at only one stent having to be deployed in the tax segment. 35% of the TAC uh, implants were deployed in the mid and distal tibials. And you can see this to the right of the slide by the depiction that these 35%, and typically the mid and distal segments of the tibials are considered a taboo of placing some sort of scaffold. But as you can see, 35% of these were placed there. In terms of 12 month X-ray of the TAC implants, there was no fracture, migration, or embolization. Remembering the six month results, um, the six month results did meet its primary and secondary endpoints, ultimately leading to its approval. Remember the primary safety uh, met its endpoint at 1.3%, primary efficacy met its endpoint at 95.7%, and the secondary efficacy at 81.8%. The unpowered secondary, the six month target limb salvage was high at 98.6%. When we look at the 12-month um, the data, this is the tax segment and target lesion patency. So for the tax segment, remember the definition for tax segment patency was 12-month duplex ultrasound defined as flow or no flow in the tax segment. And this could be five millimeters above or below the tax segment. And if there was a gap between the two tax, uh, it still in, was included in the tax segment if it was less than or equal to one centimeter. In terms of target lesion patency, this was 12-month duplex ultrasound, a flow or no flow in the entire balloon angioplasty length. So patency in the tax segment at one year was 81.3%, as you can see uh, depicted here in blue, and the target lesion was 78.6% at, uh, at one year. When we look at freedom from loss of patency in clinically driven TLR, so now we've added clinically driven TLR, it was still high at 72% at 360 days. When we just look at and we just pull out clinically uh, driven TLR rather than flow or non-flow, just the CD TLR was 83.1% at 360 days. In terms of target limb salvage, um, as you can see, it was high uh, for all Rutherford classes at 96.8%. When we specifically look at Rutherford uh, classification four and five, it was 96.1% at one year. When we look at amputation-free survival, again, it was high um, at 89.3%. 
including all Rutherford classes, and 89% when we just looked at Rutherford class four and five. So now looking at improvement in toe brachial indices and baseline wounds. As you can see, it was a, there was a significant difference between baseline in, uh, compared to six months as well as 12 months. And at 12 months, it maintained um, the uh, efficacy seen at six months and was slightly higher in terms of the toe brachial indices. In terms of wounds healed, uh, uh, and wounds improving, this included 85% of the population, uh, whether they had a minor or major amputation. And then there was 15% of this population where the wounds were unchanged, worsening, or amputated uh, prior to the 12 month, uh, and this was missing data, about 6%. Looking at Rutherford classic, uh, classification, there was a sustained improvement in Rutherford class, as you can see by this depiction. Um, at baseline is defined in blue, um, uh, and in darker blue is the 12 month uh, and forward, so that it moved, um, so the, um, the number of patients not only moved forward, uh, it also moved to the left. Uh, as you can see, left to right is Rutherford classification 01 to Rutherford 6. So 60.4% of patients improved greater than or equal to three Rutherford classes, and 79.1% of the patients improved at least or less than or equal to two Rutherford classifications. Looking at quality, life met, quality of life metrics of mobility, pain, daily activity, and general health, all of them improved um, going from baseline to 12 months. And in conclusion, regarding this study, this is a new therapy for dissection repair. First, below the knee vascular uh, for this is the first below the knee vascular implant to achieve FDA approval. It's a unique trial because it's the first trial to enroll 100% of dissected vessels. And this is the TAC implant repaired 100% of its post-PTA dissections. The 12 months results showed no fracture, migration, or embolization. There was a high 81.3% Kaplan-Meier tax segment patency, and, and as well as a 83.1% Kaplan-Meier freedom from CDTLR. There was sustained improvement in Rutherford uh, classification, TBI, and quality of life metrics. For the chronic, chronic limb, or for the critical limb ischemic patient, Rutherford 4 and 5 patient outcomes were high at 96.1% for the Kaplan-Meier target limb salvage and 89.89% for amputation-free survival. In the future, or looking out into the future, uh, there are two ongoing studies. One is Saval, which is a drug looting stent below the knee vascular stent compared to balloon angioplasty in critical limb ischemic patients, as well as the STAN trial, which is a clinical evaluation of the micro stent, again, in subjects with arterial disease below the knee. Both of these trials are currently recruiting. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Adams. That was a great review of the uh, TOBA uh, to or toba below the knee uh, data. Really exciting uh, stuff. As, as you noted, this is the first approved implant below the knee, so this continues to represent our evolution of technology. Moving right along, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, again Dr. Michael Lichtenberg from Arnsberg uh, Vascular Center in uh, Germany, who's going to talk to us about uh, sort of daily, real-life uh, practice uh, using uh, tax. So, Dr. Lichtenberg. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here today and to discuss on dissections and also on the current evidence for the TAC endovascular uh, system. And I would like to introduce you to our own real world um, experience. Uh, we had the opportunity and the privilege to use the system um, for a couple of years now. And I would like to introduce you also to some registry data we recently published. So we already heard about uh, the section, especially below the knee. And here's a typical case example I would like to start with. is a patient um, where we recanalized the posterior artery. And after a long uh, balloon angioplasty, you can see on the right side, there was a kind of slow flow phenomenon. And what we learned now based on the existing literature that the section might be responsible for this uh, uh, slow flow phenomenon. And um, actually now with this 
text, which was or which were already introduced now by uh, George and, and Aaron, we have now the opportunity to treat this kind of dissection and avoid drug eluding stand implantation or other, any other um, sorts of uh, scaffolds. This was the um, initial first um, SFA treatment in Europe, of which we are at the privilege to do this and record this. And you see here a complex lesion within the distal SFA um, with a, a type C and D dissection, which we then uh, tagged with a tagging device. And you can see the very accurate uh, implantation of a couple of tag devices of the above the knee uh, system really trying to um, heal the dissections, especially in the very distal part um, after a prolonged uh, uh, pilbar and DCB angioplasty. And this was the final result after um, tacking this uh, quite severe dissection scenario in the distal SFA. And you can see here on the right side after implantation of six tacks, there was a clear um, resolve of all the dissection in a very good um, outflow situation. But coming back to this case, which I showed you, the posterior tip artery phenomenon, and uh, I highlighted here on the right side the area of interest which might be responsible for the dissection and um, here also for the, for the slow flow phenomenon. We treated this area with, uh, which we analyzed here with IVIS um, during, during this intervention, which showed us there is side of dissection, also rest stenosis, maybe also a little bit kind of uh, thrombus with um, dedicated tag implantation very precisely using a ruler. And you can see here on this video how these uh, tags were implanted in this area of interest. We implanted then two tags very slowly, very accurately, to really target these remaining dissections. And after the um, tack implantation and post ballooning, you can see that the slow flow phenomenon uh, was not any longer present, and we had a very good inflow. So dissection healing means better flow, and based on the TOBA 2 BTK trial, even better patency and better clinical outcome for all patients. So therefore we aim to analysis and to assess the practical application and acute outcome um, of the TAC endovascular system for uh, infrainginal dissection repair in a real world setting um, after uh, having the choice to use the TAC system now for a couple of years. We included uh, 51 patients within a prospective trial with uh, 51 lesions and 63 dissections between January and June 2019 and concentrated on the technical success on the initial outcome after tech implantation. We treated within this uh, prospective registry um, dissections between B and F in our patients, um, treating above the knee lesions and also below the knee lesions. You see, you can see the patient lesion characteristics and also the lesion characteristics of our patients. So um, we treated uh, patients with, between Rutherford uh, three and uh, six, as you can see here, mostly above the knee patients with Rutherford three, uh, below the knee lesions include patients mainly with Rutherford five. Lesion length was a little bit longer in the lesions above the knee than uh, below the knee. But you can see here that we also include a very complex lesions, including uh, lesions with total occlusions and also uh, lesions which had um, moderate or even severe calcification, which especially count for, count for uh, BTK lesions. You see the, um, uh, the procedural deta details of, of the baseline procedure. You can see that we um, yeah, used also um, kind of lesion preparation like atherectomy, lithotripsy, and a lot of DCB, especially also um, above the knee, but also in and below the knee lesions. What is interesting that we only um, needed to implant um, a stent for um, uh, two lesions above the knee. All dissections below the knee could be treated just with a tack device. No additional scaffolding was necessary. And these two above the knee lesions needed to be treated because of remaining rest stenosis 
in a severe calcified lesion situation. You see the um, individual dissection analysis above the knee and below the knee of the patients which we treated. We mainly identified um, grade C um, dissection, meaning contrast outside the lumen, which was predominant above the knee and below the knee. In mean, the dissection length was mainly predominant um, somewhere between two and five centimeters. You, you can see that um, we uh, mainly um, were able to use just one tax system, just in one case above the knee, in two cases below the knee, we had to use another uh, tag device to resolve all um, tags. We uh, correlated um, between length of the section and the number of tag implants of the ATK and BATK system. You can see that it is likely the longer the lesion length of the, uh, the section were, the more tag implants were needed. I think that is natural. What is important and um, to say is that atherectomy or lithotropsy lowered the need for um, tag implantation. So a proper um, lesion preparation using any kind of atherectomy or shockwave angioplasty, um, it helped to reduce the dissection and therefore the need for tag implantation. This is a typical case example I would like to show you all. Here during the last slides is a patient, critical limb ischemia patient, 75 year old uh, female patient uh, with a D1 gangrene. And you can see here just a pyrenal patent uh, artery, severe stenosis, and a very slow flow in the um, distal part of the anterior tip artery. And what we did in this uh, patient here, we performed. Um, um, atherectomy using the uh, stealth CSI atherectomy system within the anterior tip artery, um, treating all the, uh, the, um, the, the stenosis and calcified lesions. And after this, we had some kind of dissection after drug coated balloon angioplasty here in these areas is uh, highlighted here. And what we did here is then we implanted here um, using roadmap technique very precisely. Um, for tax, just to resolve here the remaining dissections after atherectomy and drug coated balloon angioplasty. And after this um, implantation, of course, uh, uh, post balloon angioplasty was uh, performed. Um, we need to, to bring the tax towards the wall, open these tags very nicely. And after this, we had a very good rest of the procedure. This is the post ballooning here after the tag implantation. And then we had a very good flow here with the full resolve of the uh, dissection here in the mid part of the anterior tip artery. So let me conclude. Um, tag device is an option, especially for uh, patients um, which were treated um, with um, drug-coated balloons or atherectomy in combination. The residual stenosis of low limiting dissection of this after this combination therapy in different settings um, might be first treated with a post dilatation. And if this uh, persistent attack implantation is uh, especially also below the knee, a very good option based on our technical success analysis, and can really avoid a typical drug eluding stent implantation. So with TAC implantation, we can just scaffold the remaining dissection and improve patency and improve the clinical outcome of our patients. Thank you very much, Michael. That was uh, really fabulous. And thank you to all of our speakers today. I think moving forward, I'm gonna quickly do a uh, case here of a tibial TAC. Uh, and then uh, from there, we're going to get into some Q&A, and I want to make sure we have adequate time to address some really very interesting things which have come up, at least in my mind, from uh, watching these presentations. So it's my pleasure to uh, continue the program now by presenting a distal TAC case. And then, I, as I said, I have some great questions. I really want to make sure we have an opportunity to uh, review some great uh, discussions. So this particular case was an 82-year-old uh, gentleman who had extensive uh, 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 post uh, right lower extremity revascularization on January 10th. 
He had uh, the femoral artery treated, he had orbital atherectomy and angioplasty and stent placement, as well as angioplasty and atherectomy in the posterior tibial artery and common lateral and plantar artery. Uh, uh, this was done for a persistent painful dorsal wound, which is uh, relatively small at this point. They say it was a Wagner uh, grade two uh, wound down to the subcutaneous fat with probing, did not reach uh, down to the tendon uh, and or to the bone. You can see his medications are typical medications uh, for this group of uh, patients. I'm sure he must have been on statin as well, since we generally want to make sure patients are in moderate to high dose statin therapy. He was having trouble with uh, salazazole and just intermittently taking this uh, due to diarrhea, which he attributed to his salazazole. And here's uh, his wound, again, relatively small wound. You can see uh, you know, typical ischemic rubor around that wound. Again, doesn't look too bad, but extraordinarily painful uh, associated with the inflammation on the clinical findings. And again, this probe deeper than it actually looked and it was persistent for a long period of time. If you look at the uh, arterial imaging on the right side, I put a box around the notable finding, uh, essentially that he was monophasic downstream through all of the uh, tibial vessels due to proximal occlusive disease. So a typical uh, patient uh, with a non-healing of the foot. And here's the uh, angiogram uh, that uh, we had. And as you can see, he had had prior intervention. Uh, you can see he had prior bypass, surgical clips, the uh, prior uh, long segment stenting in the femoral popliteal region extending across the knee. On this third picture, this is this uh, bent knee lateral uh, popliteal arteriogram. And a lot of instant uh, stenosis, uh, certainly through this. And then below the knee, we sort of see this vessel here. Not quite sure where this is uh, starting, but looks like it might be anterior tibial artery. And then we see some occlusion down here with possibly a small arterial venous fistula. As we interrogate uh, further below the knee, you can see essentially in the distal third of the calf, uh, everything occludes. Uh, when we get down uh, and do selective angiography, which we like to do in these cases, uh, to try to identify the actual wound supplying uh, vessel, we can select a perineal, didn't show much. Uh, selectively anterior tibial was occluded, but did reconstitute downstream into dorsalis pedis segment. Uh, we see a little bit, perhaps, of common plantar artery here to the, uh, to the medial calcaneal artery, uh, but not well-defined, uh, and uh, the rest of the uh, lateral plantar uh, portion of the uh, plantar pedal arch is occluded, and a little bit of terminus of the perineal artery is visualized as well. Suffice to say, there's extensive distal disease in addition to the proximal disease. So we accessed uh, this from a, a retrograde approach. We had actually tried uh, to cross uh, antegrade, uh, with the uh, thinking that we would have to probably go through the stent, uh, stent construct to get down to this anterior tibial artery to get this uh, dorsal foot wound. Very calcified uh, and uh, with ultrasound guidance, we we're able, uh, quite fortunately, to access this. You can see the wire doesn't advance as freely as it might uh, often do initially because of the dense calcification and very, very low occlusion. Uh, really, there was occlusion at the level of the ankle strap. And once we insert a small free French dilator, we uh, get angiography, and you can see here that we're indeed in the target uh, vessel downstream. This should be the wound uh, supply, but extensive occlusion, even the reflux angiogram fails to show any portion of the distal anterior tibial artery. And we had our catheter down the anterior tibial artery, as I had noted uh, a little bit earlier when we saw that reconstitution of the dorsalis pedis. But uh, interestingly, when we advance the wire now up this dorsalis pedis segment, it actually goes through the uh, perforating branch and extends up the perineal uh, artery. So uh, certainly that might have been some chronic occlusion that might represent some anatomic variation as well where the perineal artery is now continuous with the dorsalis pedis segment. That actually turned out to be somewhat fortuitous because we no longer needed to uh, do some stent reconstruction through the side of the popliteal uh, uh, supera stent, which is a, a difficult uh, you know, thing to do in order to get access to the anterior tibial artery, which is bridged by that stent. Now we can just reconstruct through the perineal with continuation out to the dorsalis pedis. So we went ahead and um, once we had our rendezvous, we had a retrograde uh, wire, we were able to pass this up using a 2.3 French and 2.6 French microcatheters uh, with a, uh, a uh, hydrophilic uh, polymer coated uh, wire retrograde, no 3.5 catheter above, uh, pass the retrograde wire into the uh, anti-grade uh, catheter, exteriorize it for through and through. Uh, accessed and then treated the top part, in this case with uh, laser atherectomy and impact uh, DCB, which I think uh, is a very acceptable therapy for uh, ISR and certainly uh, provides amongst the best data for that. However, we still have this uh, lesion at the bottom, so we go ahead and we uh, do uh, angioplasty. Uh, this is uh, initially with a long scaffolding uh, balloon, uh, but then we bring down a, a smaller balloon for balloon hemostasis at the dorsalis pedis uh, puncture site for internal hemostasis after pulling the retrograde uh, access. 
And you can see here we have restored perineal flow with anterior continuation and flow through the arch, but a very uh, distressing flow limiting dissection, which potentially compromises the entire procedure. We've done so well. We've opened up the top. Uh, we've uh, done the retrograde axis. We have straight line flow in the dorsalis pedis segment and through the dorsal pedal arch where the uh, wound is, but we have this dissection. Now, I write, need to be wary of the ankle strap. And in contemplating a case for this, I intentionally picked a case where there might be some discussion uh, based upon what our strategy was here, because you know, although uh, these are, are very suitable for treating the distal, the tacks are suitable for treating the distal portion of the, uh, the tibial vessels, we still have to be wary that they're prone to extrinsic compression. The ankle strap is a, a very challenging place to treat in general. So we see the dissection there. We delineated as we understood it uh, with angiographic evaluation. Uh, the patient did have some IVUS as well. I'm gonna be asking some questions about that as we move uh, forward. And we now had to come up with our TAC strategy. So, uh, you know, what we like to do in general, uh, and I'm going to discuss this with the group, is we like the idea of treating the inflow and then sort of treating the exit as low as we can and then treating in between. Uh, I have some idea about what might be going on uh, beneath that dissection, contributing to flow compromise. But the red arrows there are that ankle strap. So, you know, I was very, very uh, conscious here about how distal do I go. Uh, recognizing that uh, you know sometimes just treating that inflow may allow not just immediate but improved long-term results. So based upon that and trying to preserve that distal portion, we went ahead and uh, we went ahead to put in the four tacks that are preloaded. Again, avoiding right across the uh, instep where the ankle strap will be located. You can see our result there. Clearly, we got rid of that proximal dissection. There's still some residual narrowing, maybe 50% of the very distal uh, portion. Perhaps this is due to residual dissection, but I don't think so. Uh, we went back and did some prolonged angioplasty uh, here as well across the segment. It didn't uh, particularly change. I think that some of this represents some spasm as well and some, re and some re recoil. But again, I did not think that we had a great result. The flow was considerably improved. I did not take the videos that I left to Lichtenberg, but clearly a market improvement. So I felt very comfortable now that we've not compromised the proximal intervention. And you can see you have flow now through the uh, dorsal pedal arch. So I think that's the case. And I think the take home from this particular case are several fold. First of all, the TAC implant now provided me, at least in this case, an option to place a scaffold distally to treat a distal dissection for which otherwise until uh, TACs were available, we really had no alternative. Second of all, the strategy about talking about tax, I'm gonna get into that with our you know, excellent uh, panel here in just a moment. And I think this is really a very relevant thing. Uh, we have this tool, but how do we best use it? Uh, obviously, uh, we're trying to get uh, idealized results by treating uh, in a purpose-built way focal dissections rather than entire necessarily lesion uh, length. Uh, and uh, three, uh, of course, you know what's an acceptable result after we uh, treat these. So uh, first of all, why don't I uh, start, uh, if I can, a panel discussion. So Dr. Armstrong, let me start with you. I thought it was very interesting when you were talking about uh, dissections, uh, you provided several different uh, grades, but it seemed that across the board, regardless of graded dissection, regardless of subsequent therapy, regardless of whether stents or DCB were used, uh, higher grades of dissection were associated with greater loss of patency. So what's the current thinking? Is this largely due to lumen loss uh, and impingement on the lumen, or is this due to exposed tissue factors that are just you know, integral to dissections, which results in restenosis? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, it, it's a very interesting question. I, I think there are many mechanisms whereby persistent dissections and more severe dissections are associated with uh, subsequent restenosis and loss of patency. Uh, with dissections that are in the range of A and B and uh, C, I think that likely the presence of a flap causes some slowing of flow, although that's often not as significant uh, on an angiogram. But the exposing of the denuded endothelium uh, is likely a nidus for thrombosis, so that it's more likely that you get an early failure uh, with subsequent thrombus over the course, you know, maybe of a few weeks to months. And that may be, uh, you know, one of the mechanisms we see of some of these early failures. I think with the uh, dissections that are in the grade of C and higher, you, you also have a uh, visually apparent slowing of flow. And I think that sluggish flow also creates a nidus for subsequent thrombosis formation. 
And you know, it, it may also be there are other mechanisms we don't know of, uh, including uh, exposing of the media may uh, stimulate the inflammatory response so that you get a more aggressive restenosis pattern as well. But I think that's really an area where there needs to be more research. And I also think some better understanding of the relationship between dissection severity. And, and I think we can all agree that dissections that are in the D, E, and F category, um, typically most operators will treat with some kind of uh, dissection therapy, whether it be a tack or a stent. But we need more data with regards to A, B, and C dissections and really understanding how those affect uh, patency as well. Great, thank you. You mentioned uh, intravascular ultrasound, obviously, is a frequently used modality for identifying dissections. So we don't have an idealized dissection grading uh, for peripheral dissections, particularly uh, below the knee. How does intravascular ultrasound fit into the evaluation of dissections? And kind of related to what you just said, is the presence of dissection severity on angiography or IVIS important, or is the flow important? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, as, as you might expect, when you look on intravascular ultrasound, we, we all recognize that you see a lot more than you appreciate on angiography. And uh, some preliminary data that Nick Shamas and others have published has suggested that you see an increased prevalence of dissections by intravascular ultrasound, you know, perhaps even five or six times more frequently than we see by angiography. But also, I think importantly, the uh, IVIS provides some important data with regards to how circumferential the dissection is. You know, perhaps it matters whether it's a less than or, or greater than 180 degrees across the lumen, as well as how deep that disruption is uh, within the media. So I, I think that there uh, obviously needs to be more data to support this, but uh, using IVIS, I think, can sometimes help identify some areas of uh, what are otherwise uh, dissections that are not as apparent on angiography or perhaps don't look as severe uh, and that we might judge as being a B dissection, but which actually penetrate deeply into the media and probably are associated with a higher risk of, of subsequent uh, target lesion failure. Is there anything you would see on IVIS that might change your thinking from doing focal uh, tack dissection strategy to putting a more confluent scaffold like a stent? You know, I think the major uh, question there would be the extent of any recoil. I think the TAC is a great device for treating dissection. Uh, if you do have recoil that, you know, is due to uh, residual uh, plaque that, you know, perhaps hasn't been uh, dilated as much, then, you know, maybe reasonable to consider a scaffold uh, in those cases that has more radial strength. Uh, but I think the TAC is great as a purpose-built device for treating dissections for, for exactly that purpose. Thank you. Dr. Adams, let me turn it over to you a little bit. Obviously, you presented some fabulous uh, TOBA BTK uh, data, uh, which has been shown uh, recently as well. And, you know, again, this is potentially paradigm changing. I have a question. You said the average uh, dissection length was 2.4 uh, centimeters. The whole lesion length was 15.4 centimeters. But clearly, sometimes within a treated segment, you might have an area that's dissected, a relative uh, interval that's not, and then another dissected. Were those counted as separate lesions if they weren't contiguous? Um, no, they were not counted as, they were counted as separate lesions if they were not contiguous, that is correct. Um, so if they were contiguous, then it was one lesion, absolutely. So, and that was where the tack was placed within, with inside the balloon angioplasty segment. And those are the two things you're referring to, John. Right. And I don't know if I, uh, I missed it, but, you know, obviously there was a wide range of dissections, but do we have any information regarding the dissection grades that were tacked and the outcomes based upon baseline dissection grade? Or as far as we understand or your experience with this, will the baseline dissection grade not affect the long-term outcomes? Yes, great question. So there was, if you remember, I, I pointed out the dissection grades A through E. What was interesting was is that the way the study was designed, it was up to the operator to decide whether uh, the balloon angio angioplasty segment that had a dissection warranted a scaffold, warranted a tact. And as you saw, the majority of cases were classified as A or B dissections. Now, it's interesting, you know, you talked to Aaron or some of the questions you asked Aaron um, were on, on dissection grade, and, and does it matter whether the dissection is above the knee or below the knee, right? We're working with a smaller vessel, um, and for some reason, the operators in this study thought that even in the majority of cases that had an A or B dissection, uh, they warranted a scaffold. Remember, historically, all we've had is balloon angioplasty, and the mechanism of action by plantar balloon angioplasty below the knee 
is by dissecting the vessel. So maybe uh, we do derive benefit um, by, dis by uh, scaffolding those dissections, even if they aren't flow limiting. So we may derive benefit because as you know, anecdotally, many of these people return uh, or we have to do multiple interventions on this critical limb ischemic population because either the vessel recloses for some reason, maybe because of a dissection, uh, and the wound has not completely healed as of yet. So um, I throw a lot of things out there. There's a lot of unknowns. Right. Well, clearly, you know, I'm sure uh, we all have been sort of trying to push the limits of these a little bit as we try to better understand how best to use tax. Do you have any sense, uh, George, about the fate of any residual dissections? I, I understand that there are relatively short dissected segments in the trial, so there are no residual dissections, but you know, Dr. Lichtenberg showed a case, there's some residual dissection. I intentionally showed a case where it was uh, amazing, but not 100% perfect results. So any idea about the fate of those residual uh, dissections after attacking? And you know, I have this concept in my mind that you, know, you have the dissection, but then you have a little intramural hematoma related to that. So you may still have some narrowing adjacent to a dissection, which takes some time to heal. But do we have any uh, sense, or do you have any sense about what happens if there's a lesser degree dissection after tacking? Does that do better? That's a, that's a great question. Or, or I may throw another question at you, John. You know, if, if, you, if you're able to tack the proximal segment, for example, like a lot of us think, if it's a spiral dissection, you can tack the proximal, even if you have a more distal dissection, do those do better? Um, I, don't, I don't know if I can tell you if there's any residual dissection even after placing the tag. I would assume they would do better, but I don't have any evidence to say uh, per se that, uh, you know, the patency is, in, you know, that much more improved. Right. And a follow-up angiography, did they notice any difference? Uh, you know, obviously the patency was very high, but I guess there were not enough residual dissections to determine if dissection had improved. That is um, correct. Any plans for a real-world registry to maybe answer some of these questions? You know, I would love a real world registry and I, and I uh, anticipate that all of us as a collaborative will approach the industry to try to get this real world. Um, and I think, you know, Michael uh, has presented some really, really interesting, really good real world data. So I would anticipate that's where we would go next. So Michael, that's a good transition to uh, some questions I wrote down for you. So uh, first question, which I think really is relevant to all of us as we transition to using tax in our practices, how have tax change either your vessel prep and or your balloon sizing strategy? Yeah, that's, a, that's a very good one. Um, actually, since we, we have the possibility to use the tags, um, we use a very aggressive uh, lesion preparation strategy followed by DCB as above the knee and also for, for below the knee. And with this aggressive um, lesion preparation strategy, including all atherectomy, lithoplasty, and so on, um, uh, followed then by DCB, we just focus on the remaining dissection or restenosis, and we significantly lowered the amount of real stents with that practice. So uh, I personally believe this is a very good strategy. So um, uh, commenting on that point, what you brought up um, to do in uh, real world registry, I would definitely include such patient or uh, sort of strategies, um, atherectomy followed by DCB and then go for, for tacking would be very interesting to, to evaluate this combination therapy, actually. Um, I think this could be a very good therapy option for our patients in the future, avoiding long stand implantations. Yeah, it would be certainly interesting to see that in a uh, larger group of individuals with more uh, complex sort of lesion morphologies. You know, we have this idea uh, that we've sort of promoted about intent to tack, which is one of the reasons I asked the question which is very much like you said, you know, we do vessel sizing with intravascular ultrasound. So we know the real vessel size, so we can actually optimally dilate the vessel. We use, you know, relatively aggressive vessel, uh, vessel preparation with atherectomy or some other modality, followed by a larger balloon than we might typically have used in the past, understanding we now have dissections, uh, we will have dissections for which we now have a tool. Has this been your strategy? Have you, has this led you to being able to use larger balloons ultimately to try to get better lumen gain? Yeah, especially below the knee, I must say. And um, I think that's something we learned. And um, commenting on what, what you said, Erin, using intravascular ultrasound, I think with uh, using IVUS below the knee, we could even 
um, do a much better balloon angioplasty, go for much better um, lumen gain. And if there are dissection, then we can, can go for, for uh, dissection healing using tax. So um, I think with this improved lumen gain, I think we can even uh, increase the patency rates within the CLI patients, doing a very good job, especially for, for, for long-term patency, wound healing, and so on. So maybe I was guided um, interventions below the knee using appropriate sized balloon angioplasty, regardless of fear of dissection, we can heal them now. I think this is a very good way how to deal with complex lesions below the knee now. As a follow-up to that, I loved your idea of hotspot, uh, you know, tacking or stenting or scaffolding. Um, but maybe you can walk us through where you place the tacks, how many and what location. What's your thinking regarding where you want to deploy those tacks? They're very precise, so obviously you have to make critical decisions about where to deploy them. I gave my idea in that one case, but, you know, how do you approach this? Yeah, I think this uh, that's a kind of evolution we made since we used the tags. And in, in the beginnings, we placed a lot of tags in the, within the dissections. But now, as George said, maybe it makes sense to really start taking just um, at the at the, at the beginning and maybe at the end to really adapt the dissection to the vessel wall. Um, so this is something uh, we learned actually, and. Um, I think you, you don't need that much tax actually to heal all these uh, dissections. Yeah? Um, what is clear, when we, whenever we used IVUS, we definitely used more tax. Um, this was also within our registry, I didn't show these data. But IVUS, you know, you, you see much better, you see more obvious if there are persistent dissection or other remaining things, then you definitely go for more tax implantation. So um, IVUS is not always good yeah, in terms of using uh, scaffolds because uh, there are people say uh, it's a scaffold maker. Yeah? Um, so, so we definitely need to find guidelines or recommendation, um, especially for, for the tags, uh, when we should place the tags, where should we place the tag, and how many tags we should place. I think there are a lot of questions we might focus within an all commerce registry and learn a little bit more from, from all commerce uh, data. And just for my personal curiosity, for how long do you do your post tac balloon inflation and does it matter? Yeah, not a general recommendation. I, I do it quite shortly, half a minute um, with, um, with the diameter of the vessel. You know? So usually half a minute, you know, kind of that post dilatation. It really remains on the on the characteristic of the, of the lesion beyond. Yeah, if it's still a restenotic lesion, calcified lesion, then I definitely do it longer. If it's just a very easy type A B dissection, then quite quite short actually. You know. Aaron, is there anything that something anything that would change your post tack balloon inflation strategy? Yeah, I I would agree with Michael that I generally do a you know relatively shorter and inflation for the post dilatation. My thinking is that the main goal there is to ensure that you have adequate tack expansion and um, really, really ensure that you have good flow. I think I might do a longer balloon inflation if, if there's any recoil or, you know, maybe if there's a sense that there was some intramural hematoma to really uh, expand out the vessel. But, but I think in general, a shorter inflation than, than the inflation we tend to do, you know, pre tack implantation is reasonable. Right. And my last question for you, uh, George, you know, I left some uh, residual narrowing really down by the, uh, the ankle joint there, the ankle uh, strap. Uh, would you have been more aggressive about that? I mean, obviously, I'm learning as we all are. Uh, you know, how low do you go? Are you comfortable across the ankle strap? Are you, I mean, where do you end the task? Yeah, yeah. John, John, it's a tough segment, but you, to, to make me feel better, what I usually do is I'll plantar and dorsiflex the foot to see if those ankle straps were released and it, it actually makes the vessel larger so you don't see that compression that you're, you're describing. Um, because really not many things work around, behind that ankle strap right. um, because of that compression. So I don't think I would have done anything more. I would have done just exactly what you did. Great. Well, guys, this has been absolutely spectacular. I mean, I've learned a lot. I'm sure the audience uh, will learn a lot uh, too. Clearly, this is an exciting new technology. And as we said, the first approved implant below the knee with you know, other technologies uh, in the pipeline. So I think this uh, furthers our ability to treat 
uh, lesions, perhaps in a different way or more aggressive way than we have in the past, and extends really uh, what we can do for uh, fighting critical limb ischemia. For those of you who joined us for the program today, uh, to receive your uh, CE credit, you'll need to complete the evaluation located on the right-hand navigation bar. You'll then be able to download or print your certificate. So let me uh, thank all the attendees uh, primarily um, for uh, being part of the CME program. Let me thank each of you on the panel uh, individually. Your, uh, your presentations were spectacular and uh, what you've learned from you has really been remarkable. So thank you everybody for your time and efforts. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.